to my channel. We're in for a great discussion today. We're going to be talking a little bit about asking questions. And as we all walk out life, at some point, we're going to have questions. And we have this amazing benefit as believers that we can take our questions to our Father. Now, we often get kind of sideways because we have our own ideas about how he should work things out before we give him a chance. But what we're going to see is that God's justice is not like man's justice. We're gonna talk about that in today's video. Let's go. Join me for the lesson entitled A Prayer for Justice. My name is Waynell Henson, and you know me as that Sunday School Girl of that SundaySchoolGirl.com. We have a power pack lesson this week, and you know what? If you just looked at the printed text, it was very unassuming because I think it's just like eight printed verses, but there is so much in here that we need to pull out. We got started on Markup Monday. If you missed that with us, you should go back and check it out because that's how we're learning to study together. And here's the part where we review everything that we pulled out this week. But before we do that, you know that I've got to say hello to some very special folks, and those are the people who are new around here. And if that's you, allow me to say welcome. You have just joined the largest cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. This is also the most thumbs up, like, review of Sunday school lesson, the international Sunday school lesson on YouTube. I'm so glad that you're here. There'll be four ways that you're able to engage with this video while you're here. The first thing I want to do is get you connected. So look down below and you only have to do this once. I want you to get subscribed to this channel. So click that button. That will get you connected. After that, look for a picture of a bell. That's your notifications button. And you want to click that too, so that you get a notification by email or on your phone every time there is content uploaded on this channel. The third thing, I always ask everyone to do this, and that is just to click that like button. Doesn't cost you a thing, but it is so encouraging for me, and it also tells YouTube about the type of content that you enjoy. Finally, anyone, everyone, you're always welcome to leave a comment down below. So much rich information is shared among peers on this channel. I read them. I love engaging with you all, and we're helping each other to grow and learn through the Word of God. Before I go into the lesson, I need to remind you that seats are filling up for the Step Summit 2020 in Denton, Texas. That is my Sunday School Conference. I'm so excited to connect with leaders superintendents, Christian education directors, teachers, pastors from all over the country who are looking to build and enhance their Sunday school ministries. If that is you, I want you to visit stepsummit.com. $25 will reserve your seat today. And then you have until August to get the balance of it paid off. But it is going to be a tremendous time of empowerment and encouragement for people who are building the work of Sunday school. So make sure that you get registered. All right. I want you to look down below the very first uh, link it, that you'll see is the TSSG notes. Those are my personal study notes that I prepared to go along with this week's lesson. So grab those, print those, get your Bibles, your journals, your pens, your handy dandy notebooks. We've got a good one and it's time for us to get into this Our lesson. lesson title is A Prayer for Justice. The Bible basis is Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and 12 through 14. The Bible truth. The prophet Habakkuk prays for God to address the injustice in Judah. Our memory verse is verse 13. And the lesson aim is that we will agree that the justice of God differs from human justice, aspire to the establishment of justice and fairness to all, and proclaim God as the source and model for justice. Okay, story time. And this happened several years ago, but it was during this time of year because it was during March Madness. A group of my girlfriends went to an event, and you know how it is when the girls get together. It's a whole lot of fun, but ultimately, if there are single women in the mix, there'll be some discussion about dating and desiring to be married. And so one of the friends says, you know what? If we are all sitting in watch meeting on December 31st of this year, and I am not at least dating someone, I am just going to lay on the altar and say, why, Lord, why? And all this week as I studied this lesson, that's all I could hear was that question, why, Lord, why? 
because it may not be about dating and or marriage, but many of us have grappled with that question, why, Lord, why? When we look at everything that we have to encounter in our lives, when we look at what goes on in our communities, the injustice in our own justice system, and sometimes even watching those around us who seem to prosper and we don't feel like we're winning in the same ways, but we feel like we're doing all of the right things, we've asked that question, why, Lord, why? Well, this week we are studying about a prophet who's got some questions that are along that line. Why, Lord, why? Don't you see? Don't you hear? And what are you going to do about it? We are continuing our study on justice. God requires justice. And this week, we move to the Minor Prophet book of Habakkuk. And we talked about this last week. Minor prophets don't mean that they did not have major messages, and this week is no exception. Now, we don't know a whole lot about Habakkuk, but that that we know, especially if we look at the historical context, will be very valuable for helping us to unearth a lot of the learning from this lesson. Now, you heard me mention in the intro that the printed text was a very short reading, but there is so much in here when we look at it in its context. Now, Habakkuk was the last minor prophet to preach before the Babylonians invaded Judah. Now, they invaded Judah three times, and ultimately, they were the ones who took Judah into captivity. His name means embracer, and he likely wrote his book and prophesied during the time of Jehoiakim, who reigned. And we'll talk about this because it'll be important after King Josiah. Now, he refers to himself always as Habakkuk the prophet, which suggests that he was likely a professional prophet. And it was suspected that he was a priest before he was a prophet. And this is a very short book. I know it's short reading, but it's also a short book. There are only three chapters in the entire writing. And at the end of it, you will see that he played stringed instruments. So there were things about him that would suggest that he came from a priestly role. Now, prophets, as we know, are the mouthpiece of God. But this writing is really interesting because even as we start to read, this um, reads more as a conversation between the prophet and God. He actually opens up a conversation and God becomes the responder versus a message that he was to go and to hurl or to share to God's people. We're going to see that it begins with a, a burden, a very heavy burden, but this is also the prophet who wrote the words that many of us know as familiar text. He begins with the burden and he ends with the words, the just shall live by faith. We begin in verse one. We have verses one through four. And then we had this large break and we jumped down to verse 12. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, that's verse one. The first thing we have here is Habakkuk. And he at this point is what I've labeled a perplexed prophet. He is looking around and all he sees is problems. Everything that he can visually see is problematic. And the things that he sees, the injustice, the sin, the iniquity, weigh heavily on him. And that was probably my first aha, is that as we go through our lives, we should not passively walk through ills, injustice, sin, and just be okay with it. It should still prick something inside of us that tells us inside that that's not right, that we should take these things to God, that something has to change, something should be done. And for this prophet, it became a burden. What is a burden? We discussed burden la burdens last week. It is something that becomes heavy on you. It is something that troubles you. And if you pay attention to the way it's written, this burden was one that was based on what he saw, something that he perceived with his eyes. My next aha was that we've got to pay attention to see, and we cannot walk passively through life and not pay attention to what is going on around. So what exactly did he see? It was sin, sin and iniquity all around him. Again, I thought this was interesting because many prophets were called to win, to speak out against sin, to win God's people back to him, to get them back on track. 
But here, this prophet seems to initiate this conversation with God based on his own observation of everything that was going on around him. So why would he be sensitive to that? And that's where our background gets to be really important. So under the reign of King Josiah, uh, that was in the early days of Habakkuk's ministry. And that was somewhat a time of revival. Just Josiah was one of the good guys. He was uh, very young when he began to reign. Um, but at the age of 16, he sought God. And by the age of 20, he was called to renovate or to rebuild uh, in the house of God. And while they were doing the work inside, they found a copy of the Old Testament and he read it. And in reading God's word, he was changed. Now, it's interesting because the word had been missing, but no one missed the word. And they had gone astray for not having the direction of the word. So here was this young ruler who was changed by the the word and he began to do the work to reinstitute the feast and the Passover among the people. So it was a time of revival and there was a lot of um, reformation but there was no revival truly in the hearts of the people. Now what do we reasonably expect after a revival? Even naturally, when we have our times of revival, it is a time of refreshing. But ultimately, the goal is that people will leave revived, renewed, refreshed, inspired to, des to please God in a greater way, to live for God in a greater way. But this was not the case with Judah. The revival really didn't take root with them. It did not make a difference in the hearts of the people. They were doing all of those outward things, but revival was not in their heart. They were doing activities, but they had not been changed on the inside. So after Josiah comes the next king, which is Jehoiakim, and he was an evil king. He was given a scroll by the prophet Jeremiah that detailed how they should live, how they should behave, but he didn't want to accept it. In fact, he took it, he cut it up, he threw it into the fire, but destroying and rejecting God's word did not change the message of the word. And it was clear that prior, prior to the revival, the people did not miss the word of God and now they had it, they weren't changed by it. And here was at this point, rejection of God's word. The revival was not long lasting. Remember, we're talking about what is it that was bothering Habakkuk so much? The revival was short lived and now God's word was being rejected. So this was a bad time. Time. It was a dark and deteriorating time and God's people were not focused on the right things. They were not living right and their enemies, the Babylonians, were gaining strength all around them and taking down other nations and we need to keep that in mind too as we continue to talk about how this entire conversation with God plays out. So we've got these unfocused people who are not committed to God and remember that we also have Enemies gaining strength and taking down nations. Verse 2, here comes the question. Habakkuk asked, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou will not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou will not save. Um, there are two questions or two issues that he has here. He has an issue with the things that he sees around him. And he also has an issue that's internal because he's disappointed with God's response. Have there ever been times that you were disappointed with the response of God? Now, at this point, again, this is not a message from God. He is talking to God. And here were my ahas with that. The first thing is that we can tell God what bothers us. We can take our concerns to him. That's what in our lesson title, the prayer, that's our communication, our conversation with God. And we've been talking about that. What a blessing it is to have access to our father. And we can talk to him about what bothers us. I also looked at this as an aha that Habakkuk had a relationship with God such that he could have a level of communication that was so connected that he could access God in prayer. And not only that, out of relationship, he had built an expectation of God. He expected that God would be able to move and to do something about what was bothering him. And it was the sin, the ills that bothered him so much. And it didn't just bother him in a way that he saw it and kept moving. 
it provoked him. It provoked him to take his heavy concern to God. And if you look at how this is written, he asked the question, how long shall I cry? This tells us that he didn't just take his concern to God once, but he took it to God over and over again. He kept that heavy burden before the Lord. Why? Because he wanted God to intervene. He wanted change. He was bothered at this point because God had not moved. The sin and the iniquity that he saw bothered him, but in his uh, way of seeing it, God was letting all of that go unjudged. Again, I looked at it as great expectations. He's asking God to move based on the belief that he has that God is able. And when we take our concerns to God in prayer, that's why we go to him knowing that he has this ability to change things. He has the power to change things. So what was it that he was reasonably expecting? He wanted God to bring justice and judgment. He wanted God's people to be put back on track. But his expectations had been failed. And so now he had questions. God did not meet his expectations. And so now he asked these tough questions again. How long shall I cry? He's saying here, I saw the problem. I did my part. I brought it to you. And now why aren't you doing your part? So his first issue here is your timing, God is not working with my timing. And in the TSSG notes, I give you a couple of references because he's not the only person in scripture that has asked God how long. And if we think very practically in our lives, as we go through seasons, there are times that things get tough. And it seems like we're in a season for a period of time and it's not going quickly enough for us and things aren't changing. And we ask God, how long are you gonna let me stay in this? Don't you see me here? That was his next problem. He was feeling unheard. He says, I cry. And that language is very vibrant. He was screaming. He's passionately calling for help. He says, and you just let me lay here and scream. He felt unheard, unanswered. And in the TSSG notes, I give you other references for others in scripture who also felt that God did not hear them at some point. Job is among them. Jeremiah, when it feels that we're praying over and over again, God, don't you see me? God, don't you hear? Here was his next problem. I don't see anything changing around here. Not only are you not responding, it would be one thing if you didn't necessarily talk back to me, but then I saw something changing. He's explaining that I don't see any change. I don't see any response. He says, you don't save. You're not doing anything to save or deliver or to bring justice. You're not doing anything about this heavy stuff, this sin that I see. Here are my personal reflections. There have to be things, again, that provoke us to take them to the heart of God. We have to be confident enough to move from just observation to taking things to God in prayer. And I had a reflection um, of this question. How does it feel for us when we've kept petitions before God and it seems like he does not respond? When it feels like he doesn't care, when it feels like he's not paying attention, that's gonna be a great discussion question if you are teaching on this Sunday. In verse three, he says, why do you show me this iniquity and cause me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me and they are there are they that raise up strife and contention. Again, the scene that he sees remains unchanged. It's like a really bad movie. He's explaining, I watch this same thing day in and day out. And he asked God, why do you even let me see all of this disturbing stuff? Well, what exactly is he seeing? He sees evil, trouble, violence, fighting, quarreling, people who can't get along. And then I asked myself this question personally, what reasons, for what reasons does God allow us, you and I, to see what is going on around? In verse four, the Message Bible says it this way, justice is a joke. Habakkuk says that the law is slack and judgment doesn't go forth. And for the wicked do compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceeded. He's saying that there is law that's supposed to address this, but at this point, even the law is powerless. It's paralyzed. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. In fact, at this point, it's also incapable of doing anything against this kind of ill. And when the law is incapable, he's saying, the next thing we have, God, is you. We need you to do something about this. 
Now, in your daily readings, you picked up the uh, verses, I think, 5 through 11 are critical before we just jump into verse 12. So here's a quick summary of what happens um, in verses 5 through 11. God does respond. He responds to the why, Lord, why moment with Habakkuk. And he gives his plan. God has a plan. He's going to use the Babylonians, those same Babylonians we talked about in our background. He's going to use that wicked nation to take down Judah. He tells Habakkuk, listen, don't accuse me of not working. Don't accuse me of not hearing you, of not doing my part. Because the truth is, if I told you what I really had in my mind, it would absolutely blow your mind. But I tell you what, since that's what you wanted, get ready. Don't worry about it. I am going to do something about it, and it's going to shock you. It's going to be big. Uh, the people had disregarded God, and he had continued to show them mercy. He had not allowed their enemies to overtake them. But at this point, he says, you know what? The Babylonians, that great and terrible nation, the one that's been taking over all those other nations, you know what? I've been a protective shield. I haven't allowed them to get to you, but now... Shield's gone. They're going to get to you. I've taken the protective layer away. And God tells Habakkuk that he's going to allow this ruthless enemy, the Babylonians, to punish them. And the Babylonians were savage. They did not play by others' rules. They made up their own rules and they brought grave destruction wherever they conquered. And he said, you know what? I've been showing you mercy by not allowing them to get to you, but they're going to have no mercy on you at all. And at that point, when you are blown away, that's what's going to force the people to have to come back and call on me. So that was God's plan. And that takes us up to verse 12. At this point, Hezekiah is like, hey, wait, wait, wait. Wait, God, I, I know I told you I wanted you to respond. And I did want you to do something. But yeah, you kind of took it too far, God. He says, art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment. And, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. So, again, God answers with his plan. But now Habakkuk's got a whole nother question. Habakkuk, first you wanted to know what God was going to do and don't you see and how long are you going to let me do this? And now God delivers a plan and he is not real cool with God's plan either. In fact, he wants to know. God, why would you use our extremely wicked enemy to punish us? Why would you use these extremely wicked people to punish people who are more righteous? We're more righteous than they are. Why would you do that? So again, more questions. He doesn't seem satisfied with God's solution. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to him. God's justice it's not the same as man's justice. God has been holding back. He's been this protective layer. When it appeared from man's perspective that God was doing nothing, the truth is God was showing his mercy. And so now the solution seems worse than the problem. And God's solution would mean more problems. So again, first Habakkuk challenges the what? What are you going to do? Now he challenges the how. Eh, I really don't like your plan, God. This was my personal reflection. How often do we take our issues to God, but we already have a solution in our own minds, the one that we believe that God should deliver? Verse 13, thou art a purer eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore thou lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Again, this solution just doesn't seem to align with Habakkuk's view of God's character. When he talks about pure eyes, he's talking about the character of God. You're pure and holy. And what he seems to be saying is that, God, you're better than this. You don't look at bad people in that way. Look at them, God. They're really bad people. They're terrible people. In fact, this is somewhat a comparison. He's saying we're more righteous than they are. And God, how can you approve of using ruthless and wicked people as the agent of against your own people? How could you possibly even use them in your plan? How long are you going to let these really bad people devour righteous people and you hold your tongue? But again, this was all based on what he believed about God and now trying to process this solution that he found problematic. Verse 14, he's describing exactly how Babylon treats 
um, the nations that they've invaded. He says that they make men as fishes in the sea and as creeping things, and they have no rule over them. He's talking again about this reputation of the Babylonians. When they conquer, it is nothing nice. They come violently. They show no mercy. He describes it as men being like fish in the sea, getting people caught in their nets with the intent to destroy them. He says that they are terrible. They destroy when they come. We're going to end up stopping here, and this is not the end of the story, but spoiler alert, we're going to get more of the story next week when we go into chapter two. Um, but keep in mind Habakkuk's issues here, timing and response. And God does not always respond in our way. He does not always respond in our time. Habakkuk wanted God to respond immediately, and he wanted God to do something about what he saw. But God's goals, God's justice are very different than man's. He ultimately wants man to come to repentance. That's this justice message that we have this week. Man often wants retribution. Man wants you to pay. God wants repentance. He gives us this space to come to repentance. And so as we saw God being this sort of protective layer between Judah and Babylon, Whereas it seemed like inactivity in Habakkuk's mind, for God, it was a display of his kindness, of his mercy. And Habakkuk wasn't capable of seeing that God was actually behaving in a way that was merciful. We can't always see. We don't know the mind of God. God is even able to use the agent of his choice to bring judgment. Even though that agent seemed to be wicked to Habakkuk, God used even them in his plan. But I also noted this, that using Babylon did not mean that later on they would not have to pay for their wrong. Again, we never know the mind of God. We never know the complexity of the way that he's going to navigate us through life. Why is that? Because God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so God responded with his plan. Even though it was a problem to Habakkuk, he responded in the scope of his justice and who he is and the mercy that he shows. So God's justice is different than man's justice. I have a ton of key learnings in my TSSG notes, but I'll give you the first one. And that is again, that we can take our tough issues to God. And there will be some questions in life that we have and only God can answer them. So we can take our tough questions to God. And you know what? I've heard the discussion, is it okay to question God? Well, I believe it's okay to ask God questions, but to me, that's very different than questioning God. And just like any parental or supervisory relationship, if you watch your attitude and your tone and the spirit behind it, I do believe that God gives us that space to ask questions, to understand, and more than anything, to seek his mind, his heart, and to ultimately see how he's going to navigate us through this complex terrain that we call life. Again, the balance of my uh, key learnings are listed in the notes. I look forward to things that you gained in your notes. So please leave a comment down below. Tell me things that I should add, things that jumped out to you. And if there's anything even in your background study that you think that would be helpful, I would love to hear it. All right. In the intro, I did forget to mention that I've updated on my website and on Facebook the places that I am so blessed to share in ministry on this month. So I'm excited on December 15th to be in Dallas, Texas at the Grace Cathedral Church of God in Christ. And then I will be sharing, uh, I've already shared the flyers. I'll be headed to uh, the Tulsa area, Broken Arrow, and I forgot the other city. I don't know my Tulsa geography, Oklahoma geography so well. But I will be with the Unity uh, family Church of God in Christ, and I look forward to seeing you there. If you're in those areas, please try to come and see me. I would love to see you there when I am in, uh, I'm going to get this right. Let me read this here. On Saturday, the 28th, the Unity Church is hosting a brunch at Shiloh's Family Kitchen. And then on Sunday at 3 p.m., that is their Women's Day service. I'm sorry, Sunday at 5. Wait a minute. Let me not get that wrong. Sunday. 
I was right. Sunday at 3 p.m. I'm sorry. Sunday at 3 p.m. is their Women's Day service, and I'm the speaker there. So pray for me as I travel. Again, I look forward to anything that you got in the lesson. But don't forget, I need that thumbs up like. Click that like button for me. That's encouragement. You all have a super fantastic rest of the week. I will see you in Sunday school. Bye, everybody.